Hello and welcome to uh, this short presentation where I want to offer some context and background for my contribution to the roundtable next week. My name is Alex Murray and uh, I mainly specialise in decadence and aestheticism um, and my knowledge of Scottish literature is uh, limited uh, so I hope you will excuse me for any blunders I make uh, today uh, and also uh, next week in the roundtable. So at that event I'll be discussing Stuart Erskine or Rory Erskine of Mar as he was known from uh, around 1900. Uh, there's an image uh, of him there. This is uh, taken uh, from the Whirlwind, a little magazine uh, from 1890, uh, which I'll be discussing um, in some more detail next week. I'm particularly interested in his activities at the intersections of conservatism and decadence in the 1890s periodicals networks. While we're looking at these uh, in some detail next week, I want to outline the broader terrain here by discussing the interest in or even the obsession with neo-Jacobitism at the fin de siècle, particularly amongst those who we might uh, think of as being decadent. So the fundamental question I'll be trying to answer is this. Was there a politics inherent to neo-Jacobitism? If so, did that politics manifest itself as nationalist or as cosmopolitan? Was it radical or was it conservative? So it might help to offer some broader background as to why I'm even asking these questions. So my contribution is a very small outtake for a monograph I'm writing at the moment on decadent conservatism. So decadence and conservatism seemingly, given our contemporary critical and political paradigms, make uncomfortable bedfellows. As both a political social philosophy and the ideology that gave its name to a parliamentary party, Conservatism in the late Victorian period seemingly stood in symbolic opposition to the literary practices and the social politics of literary decadence. Where conservatives revered the past, decadent writers were challenging tradition. Conservatives were deeply nationalistic, decadence cosmopolitan. Conservatives were publicly silent on sexuality, while decadence consistently drew attention to erotic life. Yet the picture, I want to argue, is much more complex and the lines of demarcation between conservatism and decadence much less clear. For some decadent writers and for some professed conservatives, the two were far from mutually exclusive. That is not to say that decadent writers were sitting in the Carlton Club rather than the Café Royal or that Lord Salisbury secretly subscribed to the short-lived periodical uh, of decadence, the Savoy but rather at the center of the British conservative tradition are a set of values that many who espoused aesthetic individualism found appealing. And one of the people at this intersection is uh, Stuart Erskine. So one of the uniting features of decadent conservatism is their investment in the Stuart monarchs, both Charles I and Charles II, as well as the failed Jacobite uprisings of 1715 and 1745. A crucial element in the development of decadent conservatism um, was the uh, development of various neo-Jacobite movements at this time. So the Order of the White Rose was founded in 1886 and included amongst its members or companions, Frederick Rolfe, the Baron Corvo, and James Abbott McNeil Whistler. Um, and there was then other decadent writers who penned pro Stuart works in this period, including Lionel Johnson, Algernon Charles Swinburne, Louise Imogen Guinea, W.B. Yeats, and Ralph Adams Cram. So why exactly did Jacobitism hold such an appeal for decadent writers? Ian Fletcher has hypothesized that it was essentially a form of posturing escapism, a seemingly radical idea without consequence. He says the decadent could find it in a tragic, find in it a tragic stage on which he could perform the, his ritual of helplessness in the presence of the zeitgeist. For Jacobitism always represented the triumph of an idea over reason, common sense, and the tendency of events. Perhaps more importantly, it was, he says, politics in its least contingent form, uncontaminated by the possible. Murray Pissock suggests. The decadence turned to the Stuarts and the Jacobites of the 17th and 18th centuries into some sort of fairy tale, a myth of the past where the artists had been at the centre of a society 
made in his own image, where the masks had self-reflexively celebrated the artistic apotheosis of the iconic king. So these are some of the ways in which we understand the relationship then between uh, decadence uh, and Jacobitism, um, or neo-Jacobitism, that this is um, a sort of uh, fantastical escapist um, uh, investment. And I, I want to sort of uh, both agree with that in many ways, uh, but also want to suggest that in the case um, of Stuart Erskine, uh, we see that this actually can become some sort of practical politics, um, the practical politics that will lead to his uh, rather uh, obscure place in the development of Scottish nationalism. But to get more, to, but, but to get more of a sense of how this intersection of decadence and, and uh, Jacobitism come together, I want to talk a little bit about um, another um, fin de siècle uh, Scottish um, neo-Jacobite with an interest uh, in decadence and aestheticism, and that is uh, William Garden Blakey Murdoch. Uh, so Murdoch published in 1907, The Spirit of Jacobite Loyalty, an essay towards a better understanding of the 45, which offered a sympathetic examination of the sentiments that underpinned those fighting for the Jacobite cause in Scotland, in particular the Highlanders. So Murdoch sought to correct the overwhelmingly negative portrayal of the Jacobites in British history. In his essay is a strange mix of rigorous historical research and aesthetic flights of fancy. One of his main concerns is to frame the Highlanders as, as Celts, and his sources for understanding the nature of the Celt have a bizarrely decadent sensibility, including Arthur Simmons, of whom he wrote the first biographical study as early as 1907, um, W.B. Yeats, and then George Moore, particularly his novel Evelyn Innes. And it's particularly the aestheticism of the Celt that Murdoch finds so central to a better understanding of the Jacobites. For, as he says, the Highlander, far from being thought brutal, is regarded as belonging to the most aesthetic of races and as living a strangely romantic and poetical life in the most beautiful of countries. Perhaps the most important figure, though, is uh, Algernon Charles Swinburne, who is invoked at the, at the book's conclusion as the epitome of the spirit of Jacobite loyalty. And I'm not going to read through the quote here, but what uh, Murdoch is suggesting is that it is indeed strange uh, for, um, for someone who is famous as an English Republican uh, to be uh, um, so someone who also celebrates, who also celebrates Jacobitism and who Murdoch sees as being part of a sort of uh, Jacobite tradition. So despite his support for the Italian Risorgimento and the French Republicanism, there was in Swinburne, particularly after sort of 1880, a conservative nostalgic strain that manifested itself um, more intensely towards the end of his career. Here's the classic case whereby transgressive radical approaches to sexuality can sit very uneasily alongside patriotic nationalism. So the origin of Swinburne's affinity with the Stuarts are thought to be his pride in his family's Northumbrian roots for that country was always a stronghold of Jacobitism. So earlier in his career, uh, it manifested itself in an interest in the figure of Mary Stuart, about whom he wrote a trilogy of verse dramas, beginning with Chasselard in 1865, Bothwell in 1874, and Mary Stuart in 1881. By the 1880s, this had manifested itself as a passion for the Jacobite cause, publishing a Jacobite's Farewell, 1716, and a Jacobite's Exile, 1746, in Poems and Ballads, third series. And then in 1894, he published a Jacobite song um, in Astrophel and other poems. So Swinburne uh, also, after this point, uh, turns into um, a rabid uh, jingoist, particularly in his support for the Second Boer War. So Swinburne becomes uh, a fetishizer of blood sacrifice and of lost causes. And as Curtis Dial notes, Stuart loyalty is at times apparently for Swinburne revolutionary. Its true essence is conservative or reactionary, though. Swinburne is in revolt against the drab Protestant Hanoverian presence with its strict code of sex and its contempt for art. So as the example of Swinburne suggests then, there is no clear politics to neo-Jacobitism. Rather, neo-Jacobitism becomes an attack on contemporary Puritanism and bourgeois, um, and, and, and bourgeois habits and morals that could easily see it aligned with decadence. And this is precisely what happens. 
Yeah, on another level, there was a clear politics, and this is made clear in the 1890-91 split in neo-Jacobitism, which saw the breakaway of a Legitimist League. So the leader of the Legitimist League was um, a rather extraordinary man, um, and his name is Melville Amadeus Henry Douglas Hedel de la Cayamont de Massou de Revigny, the ninth Marquis of Rouvigny and the 15th of Ronneval. And he was a man on a mission. In an article in the, in the Abermal, Rouvigny announced the arrival of the new Jacobitism and took the opportunity to denigrate the old, that is the Order of the White Rose, which he described as Jacobite only in name, for its sole business is of an antiquarian kind. And its meetings, he said, in its meetings, he said, its members only chatter Jacobite folklore over their teacups and read dreary newspapers to each other um, under the exhilarating influence of watery clarets. So the Legitimist League was fought was made of stern stuff, and their political program included the repeal of the Act of Settlements, the repeal of the Septennial Act and the Royal Marriages Act, and all remaining religious disabilities. It was, Ravigny conceded, a bold program, but he had every confidence that it would find favour with the British electorate, which had grown weary of democracy. He said, the hearts and minds of men cannot have, all ha cannot have changed together um, can have changed during the last three centuries of democratic corruption and abuse. All ideas of loyalty and honour cannot yet have been banished from them. They only have to understand legitimate principles to support them. So Ravigny's outlandish uh, declamation of the new Jacobitism caught the eye of Andrew Lang, uh, who was um, interested, very interested um, in Jacobitism. But yet Lang made it clear that his affinity was very much with the watery, claret-swilling antiquarians of old. So Lang notes um, that this split in the new Jacobites had a sort of <clears throat> pleasing sense of history repeating, mirroring the splintering and partisanship that plagued the original Jacobites. So Lang did not agree with Ravigny at all that democracy had had its day, and that it, that it had even run out of steam. Um, because he was concerned that what might uh, take place um, um, was not the, the, the victory of, um, of, uh, of, of Jacobitism, the return of the Stuarts, but actually the return of its great enemy. So in, in a sort of uh, article uh, covering this new Jacobitism, he wrote, several centuries must pass before the golden years return. By that time, genealogy will have perished and may be difficult to find descendants of the royal master. About 2,592, the newest Jacobites will conceivably have chance, but we, alas, shall not be there to see, and to throw up our hats and wave our swords for the king. Besides, how do we know that the solemn league and covenants may not also be revived if historical circumstances in the long evolution of the years make legitimacy possible, and everything, as Aristotle says, may recur in length of time? Then the newest covenanters will be all possible also, and all the trouble will begin again. If there is a new Mary, there will be a new John Knox, new Lords of the Congregation, a new Kirk of Fields, and a new Fotheringay Castle. So the idea of Scottish history being stuck in a sort of eternal return of the religious and political turmoil of the 16th and 17th centuries underscores for Lang the dangers of turning a healthy interest in the culture of the past into anti-democratic political programs in the present. Yet in the case of Stuart Erskine, as Erskine as I'm going to explore um, in my presentation next week, uh, we will see uh, that his investment in neo-Jacobitism and decadence feeds in in complicated ways into his Scottish nationalism and his devolutionary view of the British Isles. Um, a view that seems both at once progressive, but also deeply regressive. Um, and I'm going to discuss that at length next week. <laughs>